our second reading comes from 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. But this you know, the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That short verse captures the entirety of the Christian life. We are loved by God, and so we love one another. It cannot be any other way. As John says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Loving others is at the core of what it means to be Christian because God himself is love. And so if we are without love, then we are without God. But what does that mean? God is love. Ask your non-Christian friends, what is one thing that you know about my God? And I'll bet you a donut next week that they say something like, God is love. One of the few things that just about everybody can agree on nowadays is that if there is a God, he is supposed to be loving. What we can't seem to agree on is what exactly it means to be loving. Some say that loving means live and let live. Your love means staying out of my business. Others say that loving means telling it like it is, a kind of take it or leave it tough love. For some, loving is a, a synonym for being nice. And for others, love is whatever those involved decide it to be. And in the midst of all of this confusion, we take whatever definition of love that we agree with and we put it on God and say, that is how God must be. We, take, we make God into a reflection of our idea of love. Well, Scripture has a word for this. It calls it idolatry. If we want to be faithful to the crucified and risen Christ, then we have to take this model and we have to flip it around. And instead of using our definition of love to define God, we have to base our definition of love on who God is. Love starts with God. So if you understand, so to understand love, you first have to understand God. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to compare and contrast human love and God's love. And look at how God's love seeks us out, brings forgiveness, and transforms people's lives. So let's start with that first aspect of God's love. God's love seeks us out. 
Well, back when I was a, a sophomore in college, there was this girl that I liked. Let's call her Emily. There were lots of reasons that I liked her. She was incredibly sarcastic, she was wicked smart, and of course, she was very beautiful. Problem was, I wasn't sure how to make the first move. I tried to plan out when would be the ideal, the perfect time to ask her out so I would get the response that I wanted. I thought, is it best to wait until this play that we're doing together is over? How close to spring break should I be? On the off chance that she says no, how much time do I need to give so that we can awkwardly go our separate ways? Well, I, I went and talked to a friend of mine about this, and he told me that I was being a bit of a bonehead. He said, when you find somebody like that, you just have to go for it. So that's what I did. And I think you all know how that turned out in the end. Now, this is a great example of how human love works. And this is true of romantic relationships as well as more platonic ones. It starts with us being drawn to certain qualities that they have, physical appearance or personality traits or shared interests or, or maybe a sense of humor. And then we start to desire what they can give us. We think, well, this person would make a, a really good, loyal friend. Or maybe their fun-loving attitude will, will help me come out of my shell a bit. Or maybe this is a person that I want to start a family with. From there, we form connections and attachments until one day, without even noticing the moment when it happened, we realize that we love this person. And almost against our better judgment, we find that we care so much about this other person that we start to put their needs above our own. Now, God's love works differently from human love. And that's not to say that this type of human love is bad. Not at all, actually. But God's love is in a whole other category because it is so much more. Human love seeks what is beautiful to love. God's love makes what he loves beautiful. Let me explain. Human love develops because we, we find someone that is worth loving. Love comes from the object of our affection. And by contrast, God loves us without regard to whether we are worth loving or not. He doesn't look at us and say, well, what qualities do they have that make them worthy of a relationship with me? Uh, do they have good looks or, or a bubbly personality or, or a sense of humor? What shared interests do we have? No, he doesn't do that. That's because he isn't looking to get anything out of us. As John says in our epistle reading, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God makes the first move. He loves us before we love him. We love him. He loves us before we have done anything at all because his love doesn't come from us, from the object of his affection. Instead, it comes from himself. That's why John says that God is love, because he is the source of love. It comes from him, like a, like a river flowing from a headwaters. It reminds me of a parable that Jesus once told of this one sheep that wandered away from the other 99. And so the shepherd leaves the 99 to seek out the one lost sheep. Whenever we hear that parable, we, we probably imagine a cute little lamb being carried on the, on the shoulders of the shepherd. And it's a beautiful image. But what we never get to see is the lamb just, just moments before, legs broken, covered in dirt, sitting at the bottom of a crevice. And if we saw that, we might wonder whether the lamb is even worth saving at all. But the shepherd seeks out the lamb and lifts him up, and his love makes the lamb beautiful. That's what God's love does to us. 
As Paul says in his letter to the Romans, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinners, weak and helpless, covered in in guilt and sitting at the bottom of a crevice. But in his love, God seeks us out and lifts us up, and his love makes us beautiful. And that brings us to the second aspect of God's love. It brings forgiveness. I think for a lot of us, when we think of love, we think of an emotion. I even tried to look up the definition of love. And the primary one that I found was love is a positive feeling or sensation that we experience about another person or thing. Now, perhaps that's, perhaps that's why when love falls apart, we say that we have a broken heart. We humans love others until we break. Maybe the breaking point was when someone betrayed you and you felt like you could never trust them again. Or maybe the the breaking point came as those positive feelings faded and they were replaced by resentment. Maybe that breaking point happened when they sinned against you. Maybe it happened when you sinned against them. In this room are a hundred different stories about broken love among family, friends, co-workers, even fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But here again, God's love works differently than human love. Human love loves until it breaks. God's love loves until what is broken is made whole. For God, love is not an emotion or a feeling that he experiences. Love is an action. As John tells us, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. The love of God looks like Jesus, who came down to earth in human flesh to die for our sins and to rise from the dead for our new life. Through Jesus, our heavenly father communicates everything there is to know of the type of love that he has for us. He seeks us out while we are still sinners, as I mentioned earlier. But then Jesus takes the love of God further by putting it all on the line for us. Jesus' death is the propitiation for our sins, as John says. Now, propitiation isn't a word that we use often. And it means something like this. Think of a time when some wrong has been committed by someone else against you. Maybe even something, maybe even the type of thing that breaks your love. Now ask yourself, what would they have to do to make this right? I don't mean what would have to happen for you to let it go. I mean, what would it really take for this to be really truly set right. So like, for example, if if someone stole money from you, then to really truly set it right, they'd probably have to give the money back, maybe even a little extra for your troubles. Well, now imagine that every single person who has ever lived and ever will live has done something wrong against you, the type of thing that breaks love. What would it take to really, truly set that right? Scripture gives us an answer to that question. For the wages of sin is death. God is loving, but he is also just. Just like it is, it's wrong for a judge in a court of law to say, yeah, I'm just going to let this one slide. God similarly knows that letting sin slide does not make a good and just world. And yet he loves us. So what does he do? Well, he sends Jesus, who turns God's just and righteous wrath towards sin, away from us and directs it onto himself. It's kind of like if someone said, hey, I know your friends stole $500 for you, but I'm here to pay it back for them so that your relationship with them can be repaired. Except instead of $500, it's the sins of the world. 
Jesus paid the wages of sin in our place because of the love of God so that our relationship with God and with one another can be repaired. That's propitiation. God's love loves until what is broken is made whole. Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we could be forgiven. Forgiveness is what mends broken hearts. Forgiveness mends our broken love so that we can love God and love one another. All of this because God first loved us. This brings us to the third aspect of God's love. God's love transforms people's lives. Now, whenever I do premarital counseling, I tell people that no matter how hard they try, they will never be able to change the other person. Lots of people go into marriage thinking, I don't like the way they do this or the way they do that, but I'm sure that with enough time and love, I can change them. You won't. It's not within your power. And that doesn't mean that people don't change. They absolutely do. That's part of the problem. They just might not change the way you want them to. Human love is limited in what it can do. But God's love works differently than human love. Human love must be content with the way people are. God's love transforms people into what they are meant to be. This is an area of great confusion today. Some people think that God loves people the way that humans love people. They think that, that God loves people as they are, which is true. As we talked about earlier with God making the first move and loving us while we were still sinners, God's love always acts first. The problem is when they infer that this means that God will never try to change them. And maybe that's because when humans try to change others, it usually doesn't go well. But God's love is so much more than human love. It actually does have the power to transform people's lives. And that is exactly what God wants his love to do. Because God loves us, he isn't going to leave us in our sin. It's kind of like how if you love an alcoholic, the loving thing to do is to have an intervention for them, as hard as it may be. It reminds me of the time that Jesus loved the woman who was caught in adultery. So he said, go and sin no more. Or uh, I think of the time that Scripture says that Jesus loved the rich man. So he told him to sell all he had and give his possessions to the poor. God seeks us out in his love. He forgives us all of our sins through Jesus, and then he loves us enough to work to transform us into exactly who we are meant to be. God's love is not going to quit until you are absolutely perfect. Now, God won't complete this good work that he has begun until Christ return. But when that happens, you will be Stunning. You will never make a snide comment to someone else again. You'll be completely patient, even if your kids are running around like crazy. You will never get angry or, or lose your temper. You'll be a joy to be around because you'll be full of love. Not just human love, but the love of God. And that is where God is taking us. So God's love seeks us out. It brings us forgiveness, and it transforms our lives. Going, to, going back to the beginning, I said that, that most people know that God is love, but they don't know what it means to be loving. But how would they know that when all they know is human love? The deep, great, more love of God isn't something that you can just tell them about. It has to be something that you show them. And that's why John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, so we ought to love one another. 
We have been given God's love, which means that we now have the ability, the power to, to love one another, not just as other humans do, but as God loves us. And as another wise Ben once said, with great power comes great responsibility. We have the responsibility to show people what God's love looks like. Uh, imagine if people said about the church, as they once did in its early days, see how they love one another. Imagine if people saw us loving by, by making the first move without regard to whether they deserve it or not. If, if we started with the love that comes from God instead of waiting for someone to show us whether they're worthy of it or not. Imagine if people saw a love that brings forgiveness as we showed how, how broken love is mended by the sacrifice of Christ. Imagine if people saw a love that transforms lives as we encourage one another in holy living because we trust God's word when it says that his way is the way that we are meant to be. What kind of witness would that be to the world? What kind of love would they finally be able to see? May God bring this good work that he has begun in us to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, amen.